African heads of state and government are in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia's capital, for the annual summit with the continent's economy right to the heart of discussions. The question is, what are the outcomes for African taxpayers? That's a question we'll be exploring over here in the next half hour, but it's not the only item on the menu. Here's what else is coming up. Ghana's National Petroleum Corporation is assessing the commercial potential of a new gas discovery made in partnership with ENI. And Egypt's central bank is widening the band in which banks can trade dollars. The idea here is to kill off the black market. Let's start halfway with matters on a continental perspective, where leaders attending the new Partnership for Africa's Development, the NEPAD meeting in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, have agreed on ways of making the African continent fund its own infrastructure development. They also discussed various strategies to accelerate economic growth in the continent and reduce poverty as a whole. Here's Girum Chala with more. The new Partnership for Africa's Development has been tasked with advising individual African states on strategies to achieve economic growth by mobilizing resource and more. The current chair of the NEPAD summit, Senegal's president, Maki Sall, says the agency has achieved a lot, especially over the last two years. In the face of multiple challenges, we have established priorities which represent key factors for a sustainable development and an inclusive growth in Africa. It's about reinforcing political integration and socio-political integration by establishing infrastructure projects, uh, by transforming African agriculture for a better productivity with a view uh, to achieving food security. The current summit of the NEPAD heads of state is hosting presidents like Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, who is expected to chair the African Union and Jacob Zuma of South Africa, who last year championed NEPAD's infrastructure initiative. Everyone here agrees that Africa must raise skilled citizens to maintain its development. Without the necessary skills, we will not be able to uh, have a good infrastructure progress. Because even if we can get outsiders to build our infrastructure, we need our people to be able to maintain and look after that infrastructure. The question of funding African projects remains a bottleneck for member states, slowing implementation of high-impact infrastructure projects such as railways, roads and highways. On this, Africa sees a way out in the Africa 50 Fund. The study on the mobilization of domestic resources has shown the capacity of our continent to manage its own needs by developing funding mechanisms, innovating funding mechanisms. In this framework, the launching by the African Development Bank of the Africa 50 Fund, whose objective is to speed up research, the search for project funding should be strongly supported by our states. For Africa, 2015 has been predicted as yet another year of economic growth. The IMF expects a little less than a 5% growth. Because of current decline in oil prices, most oil export-based African economies are suffering. That is why experts and even policy makers of the continent are pushing for individual states to industrialize to export value-added products. Value addition also means more jobs for the African youth population. Grumtala, CCTV, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. An Emerging Africa Summit was held on the sidelines of the AU meeting in Addis Ababa. It essentially provided a platform to look at Africa's place in the wider global economy. Here are the insights into the continent's investment outlook for the year. Fumida Miller was covering that event in a lot of detail in Addis Ababa. She joins us now from the Ethiopian capital. Fumida, what were the highlights of the Emerging Africa Summit? Well, Rama, that summit did indeed take place on the sidelines of the African Union Summit with the organizers looking at the right people at the right place um, at the right time, of course, to address a number of issues across the African lands landscape. And they looked at a number of issues with um, key 
participants from the public and private sector, including investment on the continent, the risks and the opportunities, also addressing gaps in infrastructure, as well as looking at the healthcare sector and uh, changes and reforms that needed to be made there, especially um, in the following the Ebola outbreak in West Africa that has had an impact not just there, but across the continent, even in terms of uh, tourism in other parts of the continent with a sort of stigma and incorrect information attached to the entire continent abroad. One of the other issues they looked at, of course, was new actors and strategies um, in Africa's multinational corporations uh, sector. And we also got some insight from some of those attending into the investment environment in Africa in 2015. Here's what they had to say. Understanding the oil price shocks in the world, I think uh, many of the countries in Africa need to just keep doing what they're doing, which is uh, deregulating their economies, attracting investment, building infrastructure, uh, and you know providing the opportunity which is there for private sector to earn good returns, uh, building infrastructure, effectively providing uh, cell phone connections, uh, retail, consumer opportunities, financial services. Uh, natural resources, lots happening. We need more um, intra-trade and to do so we need also to address the challenges which are infrastructural and and which are also um, harmonizing a rules across stock exchange which is one of the perspectives so that we can tap into the legal aspect of things and listing aspects as well. You know, the, the learner section have a dual listing in Joburg as well. What about the others? So the Eastern African community is doing quite well. Um, but, but intra-trade would come, come with a lot of challenges, cultural one, language barriers, and some others as well. So I think most of them have good intention. We still need to see this in a very practical way. Now, Rama, what was key to the organizers here was uh, moving along this from being just more than a talk shop, instead of repeating this mantra that Africa's rising, which indeed it is, they instead wanted to focus on how far Africa has come and uh, what the uh, priorities are going forward and just securing the future that, that Africa can indeed provide. We know the potential that Africa ha has. We've heard it many, many times over. It has 30% of the world's mineral resources. It has 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land and of course Africa's economy the size has trebled in the last 12 years alone and also Africa will provide the world's largest workforce and that's by 2040. So now this 2015 Emerging Africa Summit is part of that narrative that brings together of course the right people at the right time hoping to engage the necessary players to ensure that the Africa's future is of course secured with regard to investment and in a way that best benefits Africans across the continent. Rama. Indeed we'll have to leave it there for the time being that's uh, Famida Miller live from the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa looking forward to seeing what the head of state summit of course will do with the recommendations that come out of the Emerging Africa Summit. Let's take it to Ghana now. The National Petroleum Corporation of Ed assessing the commercial potential of a new gas discovery that was made in partnership with the Italian energy group Eni and the commodities firm Vitor. Now the West African country is facing quite the array of economic challenges. It's a fairly potent cocktail this runaway inflation, stubborn budget deficit and a steep fall in benchmark crude prices. Maria Galang puts it all into perspective. Speaking during its sign-in ceremony for a development plan of the offshore Cape Three Points development set to access approximately 1.5 trillion cubic feet of gas and 500 million barrels of oil, Ghanaian President John Mahama said the project is one of the biggest in Ghana since independence in 1957. The venture is set to start producing oil in 2017 and gas the following year. Last year it is anticipated by UNCTAD that uh, foreign direct investments into Africa amounted to some 53.3 billion US dollars. This current agreement that has been signed for the investment in offshore Cape Three Points is to the tune of $7 billion, and that's about 12% of the total $53.3 billion. And so it probably would be the single largest uh, investment that is being made in an African uh, country in this particular year. The assessment will be made in partnership with Italian energy group ENI and oil trader Vittal. Ghana suffers from an energy deficit that has led to power cuts for homes and businesses and helped slow economic growth 
in a country that has seen rapid expansion in recent years on its exports of gold, cocoa and oil. The gas that we expect um, would be able to power an additional 1,100 megawatts of power you know, for Ghana. That is more than Akosombo. Akosombo is 1,020 megawatts and this gas will be sufficient to power 1,100 megawatts. Um, we expect that this field, uh, viable life, should last between 15 and 20 years. Offshore oil and gas exploration will continue, according to Ghana National Petroleum Corporation's boss, Alex Mould, despite a slump in the global oil price, because project costs have been well managed. Right now we're looking at them doing some appraisal work to decide how commercial it is um, and how they're going to uh, put the project together, the security structure and the development of the project. It will have to do a lot of engineering work will have to be done to make sure that um, we can uh, um, develop this project at the least cost. Ghana produces around 100,000 barrels of oil per day from the offshore Jubilee field, which also produces around 120 million cubic feet of gas. It also plans to start production of oil and gas in 2016 from the Twenaboa and Anyara and Ntome offshore field. The economy has seen rapid growth due to exports of commodities such as gold, cocoa and oil, but the government forecasts 2015 growth easing to 3.9 percent because of fiscal challenges. Maria Galang, CCTV. Egypt's central bank widened the band in which banks can trade dollars to 10 piastres above or below the official rate, up from three. Now that prompted the lenders' dollar rates to fall to their weakest level so far. The North African country has been trying to tackle a flourishing black market in the Egyptian pound by allowing a gradual depreciation of the currency over the last two weeks. The central bank's decision to allow for a wider trading band for trading in dollars prompted the rate as rich Egyptian banks to uh, sell dollars to their clients to weaken to 7.59 Egyptian pounds to the dollar. The news hit the market that the dollar reached 7.6 Egyptian pounds. For the normal citizens, it has caused concern that prices could increase because Egypt's main food and basic necessities are imported in dollars. Experts, however, say the development is part of the central bank's war on the black market. Indeed, the gap between the official prices and the black market has been reduced drastically. The central bank has been slowly devaluating the currency over the past two months to avoid a shock to the system. Analysts expect more devaluation in the currency in the near future. Yes, sir, Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Quick run through the currency, uh, sorry, not the currency, the equity markets here for you. Uh, the Britain numbers right across the board here. Uh, the NSC, the JSE, uh, also index in South Africa. Pretty much every counter that we do track over here in the red today. The largest gains in percentage, rather losses in percentage terms coming in from Nigeria down by about nine tenths. Coming up next is a boom in the pipeline for South African air travellers as new players enter the domestic budget airline market. And the conflict in the CAR has seriously dented food production across the country. We'll have the latest grim numbers from there. Africa is on the move. It's only seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies. We help you make sense of the fast-changing African business landscape. We take you where the business is happening. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. Sustainable development and a commitment to developing partnerships with Africa. Some of the key phrases already used at the Africa Global Business Forum here in Dubai. There is a need for a predictable environment in which investors have to put their money.
Welcome back to the program. You're still watching Global Business Africa. Let's take it to South Africa now. Consumers over there can breathe a sigh of relief as the country's reserve bank kept its rates unchanged. The cost of prime borrowing remains at 9.25% for now. The repo rate, that's the interest rate charged for banks to lend money, or rather to borrow money from the Reserve Bank, will stay fixed at 5.75%. Now, the decision will was largely as a result of lower oil prices. But the South African Reserve Bank Governor, Lesija Kenyahu, has warned that slow economic growth, a weaker rand and constrained power supply will offset the benefits that cheaper oil prices bring to the table. The country's inflation is expected to remain at the upper end of the bank's target band of 3 to 6 percent over the next two years. The South African Reserve Bank has also revised the country's growth forecast down to 2.2 percent from 2 and a half. The near-term inflation outlook has therefore changed significantly, but the favorable impact of these developments on both inflation and growth in the longer term will depend on the persistence of the oil price decline. Even a moderate increase in oil prices going forward will reverse the favorable inflation trajectory. And the inflation and growth benefits, whilst welcome, are expected to be temporary. At the same time, the impact of load shedding and a deterioration of the global growth outlook are likely to offset some of the positive impacts of the lower petrol price on domestic growth. Now, the displacement of farming communities by the fighting in the Central African Republic has led to a 50% drop in food reserves. That's left about 1.5 million people at risk of famine and much, much worse, as Mahia Mutua now explains. Following the 2014 conflict in the Central African Republic, thousands of displaced people are still reliant on food aid and a volatile security situation is hindering humanitarian operations. The World Food Programme estimates that about 1.5 million people in the country are unable to source or produce food. This means about a third of the country's population is at risk. This river marks the division of a town into two parts, Muslim, Christian. And all around Bambari, there are fighting going on, attack, looting, killing, bringing more and more people to be displaced and concentrated here in Bambari. These people have lost everything, but don't have access to their land for farming, and they depend wholly on WP food for their living. A year after violence swept the Central African Republic, recurring attacks, looting and killing are still ongoing in many localities like Bambari. One Christian and the other Muslim in an area where violence has been largely sectarian. About 80% of Bambari's population has been displaced and the World Food Program is providing life-saving assistance to over 40,000 people in the area. Mahia Mutua, CCTV. Over in South Africa, low-cost airlines are poised for takeoff. In the last year alone, at least four new entrants have come into the market. With oil prices having fallen by over 50% since June, more airlines might actually enter the segment. And the sector experts over there believe this will increase competition, maybe even spark a price for in domestic airfares, all to the benefit of the consumer. As Sumitra Naidu reports on What's Hot Tonight. Some good news for domestic travellers in South Africa as new low-cost airlines enter the market. Skywise and Fly Safair launched in the last year, adding new flights on domestic routes. New operators have also added flights into the rest of Africa. FastJet began flights from South Africa to Dar es Salaam at the end of 2013, while the Zimbabwean-owned Fly Africa has added several new routes into Southern Africa and is promising fares as low as $5. It certainly is a positive step for the new uh, low-cost airline industry in terms of additional airlines coming on board and also the additional competition that's created as well as other opportunities for, for passengers to obviously fly on different uh, products and obviously look, at, look for different prices. The last time South Africa saw these levels of competition was back in 2012, but it didn't last long. Two low-cost carriers succumbed to the pressure of a tough operating environment. One time and Velvet Sky shut down due to financial difficulties. They're competing against those who have much better pricing power in the Kalulas, in the 
BA Comairs and the full service carriers like SAA. Those airlines can actually undercut a new emergent uh, airline if it wants to sell seats at 500 rand. Airline operators will benefit from the lower oil prices, but they still need bums on seats to be sustainable. The low-cost airline market grew just 1% in 2014. This year's growth is expected to be marginally higher at 2%. South African consumers are still under pressure, many still heavily indebted. It's going to be a tough environment because to bring that additional capacity in the market, this market has to grow to be able to ensure that the airlines are going to survive. And if it doesn't grow and we don't open up new opportunities, then I think we're going to, it's, it's going to be difficult to sustain all the players in the market. While the new airlines have created some good competition in the market, it remains to be seen if they will be viable in the long term. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV, Johannesburg. Let's make a quick run through commodity prices now for you. Some interesting news coming through from Egypt. Oil prices, of course, still hovering around uh, the $49 a barrel mark on benchmark Brent crude. Egypt, however, is considering trimming its subsidy expenditure on fuel by over $2 billion for the next fiscal year. That starts somewhere around June. That's according to the investment minister. But there's a caveat on this. He says they need to study the social implications of any such cuts before any decision is arrived at. Up next, we'll introduce you to a Ugandan entrepreneur who left a career in medicine to focus instead on selling household gas. We'll tell you why. different African countries and with a diverse background I cherish the personal as well as professional experiences I've had across the continent. It's this understanding of the place I call home that drives me to tell stories about its people, its needs, present and future. There's just so much happening in Africa in terms of the way forward and development. It only brings positivity. My place at CCTV Africa is about creating awareness around the realities of a continent that is indeed complex, vibrant and has great potential. Africa is my home. How it prospers, the challenges it faces, its people all matter to me because this is my future. I'm Famida Miller and I'm a reporter and anchor at CCTV Africa. Welcome back to the program. Over in Uganda, a doctor set up a fast-growing business based on the supply of household cooking gas. Now, part of his aim is to drastically reduce indoor air pollution. It's a problem a lot of us don't actually think about. And essentially, he's replacing firewood, charcoal, kerosene, whatever is being used by cleaner LPG. Emi Osirwa abandoned his career in medicine to become an entrepreneur. He's told his story to CCTV's Hilary Ayesiga. A common sight in Uganda. Many families rely on charcoal for cooking. But Emi Wasira says cooking with solid fuels is a growing public health hazard. My mother, I remember I used to spend at least three days at home or in the hospital looking after her because she was ill. Little did I know that she was suffering from at least a medical condition. It was not until when I went to medical school that I realized that it was not only my mother, but even other women outside there were suffering from ill effects of cooking energy. A trained medical doctor and public health practitioner, Wasira treated many victims of household pollution. He's now chosen to try and prevent these problems before they arise. But you can imagine this woman who spends between 9 to 11 hours in the kitchen cooking. What does she breathe in? Carbon dioxide instead of oxygen. Instead of setting up a hospital to treat patients who come with indoor air pollution, probably it would be better, if at all, uh, we could treat them with a preventative method of clean cooking fuels. His company, Westgas, 
has invested up to 300,000 US dollars in a plant that produces gas from locally available biodegradable waste. Having started five years ago with 45 plants, waste gas now reaches more than 6,000 families and the company hopes to supply about twice that number by the end of 2015. Anita Atuhire is one of the clients. She is a beneficiary of the company's scheme that allows low-income earners to acquire gas on credit. If I cook using charcoal, smoke fills the house, soot gets on the clothes and it gives me headache. With gas, cooking is now convenient and smoke-free. Statistics by the World Health Organization show that 3 billion people light and cook with solid fuel and that 4.3 million people die annually due to household pollution related illnesses. West Gas believes this trend can be gradually reversed if people could start using gas cookers and lamps for lighting. But in a country where more than 50% of the population lives on less than a dollar a day, Many families cannot afford gas and will still have to rely on charcoal and firewood. Hilara Yesiga, CCTV, Kampala. As far as currencies are concerned, some interesting stories in two different directions coming from Nigeria and South Africa. The Naira not above 190 to the dollar in trading today. However, over in South Africa, the news from the United States that rate hikes were still on the cards, that did push the rand down to about 11.66 to the dollar. But when the Reserve Bank came out and said, look, don't expect a rate cut from us because that depends on what inflation does, it actually boosted the rand up to about 11.53 or so to the greenback a little later in trading. Now, just before we go, here's a quick preview of what we're working on for tomorrow's program. African leaders, of course, will be standing with Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone. They're demanding debt relief for these countries, which are at the epicenter, or still are at the epicenter, of the deadly Ebola outbreak. We'll find out exactly what sort of debt relief measures they need and can qualify for, what options are on the table. We'll also be in South Africa. Some interesting uh, cash transfer systems are being set up over there. Ideally, as far as the design is concerned, this will be a lot cheaper than any of the other offerings on the market. We'll have the details on that and plenty more in the pipeline for you tomorrow. But that's it for this edition of the program. We'd like your feedback on what we do around here. Global Business Africa at cctv.com is the email to use. And of course, when we're not on air, Facebook and Twitter are your ports of call. The news continues over there 24-7. I'm Raman Yang in Nairobi. We'll see you in 24 hours.